Good evening. The second part of this lecture series is going to be covering the reaction quotient, Q, and Le Chatelier's principle. The reaction quotient, Q, sets up the same way as K for any general reaction. The reaction quotient is what we would find as the ratio of the products to the reactants at any point in a chemical reaction. So these are typically non-equilibrium conditions. However, when a reaction is at equilibrium, Q would equal the value for K. For any particular system and temperature, the equilibrium is attained regardless of starting concentrations. So the value of Q is going to indicate how close the reaction is to equilibrium and in which direction the reaction must proceed to reach equilibrium. The reaction quotient Q is set up the same way as K, so we can set this expression as Q equals the product concentrations raised to the power of their coefficients divided by the reactant concentrations raised to the power of their coefficients. When we look at the relationship between Q and K, there are three possibilities. Q can be equal to K, in which the system has the uh, conditions initially that are already at equilibrium. This is very rare, but no shift would occur in that situation because equilibrium is already established. If Q is greater than K, then the system is going to shift to the left. That would mean that I would have too much of the product present at equilibrium, so more of those product molecules are going to collide and will recreate the reactants. But just from a mathematical standpoint, it is easy to think about because if I want my Q to equal K, then I need to have my Q become a smaller number. So I need to reduce the number that is in the numerator and increase the number that's in the denominator until those two are equaling K for that ratio. So if we have the Q being greater than K, again, too much product, so the reaction will shift to the left in order to consume some of those products and reform the reactants. If my Q is less than K, now I have too much reactants at equilibrium compared to products, so the reaction will shift to the right, producing more products because I have more reactant molecules present and colliding with each other. And so again, too much in the numerator, or too little in the numerator, excuse me, so it will shift more towards the product side, increasing my number in the numerator, decreasing the number in the denominator until equilibrium is established once again. So here's just a little visual description of what I was just talking about. If we have the scenario where Q is equal to K, then the system is already found at equilibrium. So you can see in this middle picture, the two heights are the same. So there will be no net change in order to make them equivalent to each other. On the left-hand diagram, where I have Q being less than K, in this case, I need to have my numerator increase so I'm going to increase the amount of product, decrease the amount of reactants. So the overall net shift would be going from the reactants to the products. And then finally in the diagram on the right, where I have Q being larger than K. Now I have too much react, uh, product molecules. So I'm going to have the reaction shift from the products to the reactants. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at an example problem. This problem says for the reaction N2O4 as a gas going to 2NO2 as a gas, the Kc for the reaction is 0 0.21 at 100 degrees Celsius. At a point during the reaction, the N2O4 concentration is equal to 0.12 molar and the NO2 concentration is equal to 0.55 molar. Is this reaction at equilibrium? And if not, in which direction is it progressing? So. As we said before, we're setting up the Q expression exactly the same as we would the K expression. So the first part I'm going to have would be the QC would be equal to the concentration of the NO2 squared divided by the concentration of the N2O4. And now all I have to do is plug my values in for my respective concentrations. So the NO2 being 0.55 molar, I would take that concentration and square it and divide it by the concentration of the N2O4, 0.12. And when we do that, we get a Kc that is equal to 
2.52. Now, in this case, 2.52 is larger than 2.1, so or 0.21, excuse me. So therefore, we know that it is not at equilibrium as our first part. And then as far as the direction that the reaction will shift, again, because my QC is larger than my KC, I have too much product, so I need to reform reactants. So in this case, this will make my reaction shift to the left to reestablish equilibrium. So when we want to solve equilibrium problems, if you have equilibrium quantities that are already given to you, which is not very common in AP chemistry, uh, you just simply have to substitute those values into the KC expression and solve for K. Most of the time, however, we're going to have the initial quantities that are given to us. So we're going to have to involve that Q concept and figure out which direction the reaction is going to shift and then determine what those equilibrium concentrations happen to be. In order to do this, we have to use a little bit of math manipulations, getting into quadratic equations in some cases, and solve for what the value for X is in order to solve for the equilibrium concentrations. So a lot of times we're gonna to have to use a rice table or a reaction table to figure that out. Now, you guys have already been introduced to the rice tables for stoichiometry. It's very similar, except we have just a small little change that's involved in the uh, representation of the different letters. So the reaction, the R still stays the same. That's our balanced equation. The I, initial quantities of your reactants or products. So again, this could be your molarity. This could be moles. It could be partial pressures. Uh, there are a number of different options that it could be for a particular reaction. Uh, the C still stands for your change in these quantities during the reaction. So you're wanting to think about that as your change in your coefficients from the reactants to products. And then finally, the change that occurs instead of it being an ending amount, we're now talking about an equilibrium quantity, how much is left over once equilibrium has been established. So we're going to be using the rice tables extensively. I'm going to do a third lesson that is dealing just with rice table calculations for some of these equilibrium type of problems. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a sample problem here and show you how we get everything set up. So if you notice in this example, it says that we have a study of carbon oxidation. An evacuated vessel containing a small amount of powdered graphite is heated to 1080 Kelvin. Gaseous CO2 is added to a pressure of 0.458 atmospheres and carbon monoxide forms. At equilibrium, the total pressure is 0.757 atmospheres. Calculate the Kp for the reaction. So as we start off this process, the one thing that I just want to stress to you guys compared to when we were using rice tables in the stoichiometry unit is just the fact that you have to remember these equilibrium reactions are not going all the way to completion. So we can't just simply set up the equation of the initial minus the change in the concentration or change in the moles minus X and have it equal zero. We need to figure out what that value is at equilibrium. So as we set up our rice table, again, uh, I have my initial, my change and my equilibrium, the R, is again the balanced equation. The graphite here, that is a solid, so we can ignore the graphite in our equation. So as we start off, it tells me in the problem that I have 0.458 atmospheres initially of the carbon monoxide. I would have no, or carbon dioxide, excuse me, I would have no carbon monoxide present initially. So for my change, it is just based off of the coefficients. So I would have minus X for the CO2, and I would have plus 2X, because again, I have a coefficient of two as my change for the carbon monoxide. So when I'm looking at my equilibrium concentrations, I would now have 0.458 minus X, because we don't know how much has been converted. And then I would have plus 2X, for the carbon monoxide. 
So the amount of carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide will decrease. The amount of carbon monoxide will increase because there was none initially. So we know in that type of situation, if there's not a given amount for every single reactant or product, it's always going to shift in the side that is uh, that has the zero for an initial amount, either reactant or product. So I know that the reaction is going to shift to the right. So that's why I have the plus for the carbon monoxide. It doesn't always happen that way. It could be a case where they uh, put a bunch of carbon monoxide into the uh, chamber and that would force the reaction to go to the left side. So again, it's not always going to shift to the right, but in this case, it does. So once we have our equilibrium expression and our equilibrium amounts in terms of X, we can then go ahead and solve the problem. Now, in this case, the other really big clue that they gave us was that we had a total pressure at equilibrium of 0.757. Anytime that you see something dealing with a total pressure, I want you guys to be immediately thinking about Dalton's law of partial pressure. So I know that I would have the total pressure for the system equaling the partial pressure of the CO2 that remains plus the partial pressure of the carbon monoxide that is present. So when I set this up for my reaction, I know that I have 0.757 atmospheres equals the 0.458 minus X. And then because I started off initially with zero, I just have two X for the carbon monoxide. So if I combine the like terms, the plus two X and the minus X, I can therefore solve for X and I get 0.299 atmospheres. So to solve for the equilibrium concentration, I would then take the value for X and plug it into my expression. So 0.458 minus 0.299, that will give me a total of 0.159 atmospheres for the partial pressure of CO2. And then I have two times X, so two times 0.299 to give me a partial pressure for carbon monoxide of 0.598. If you were to add these two amounts together, it will equal the total pressure for your system, of course. And so now that I have my partial pressures, I can then place that into the expression. I have the 0.598 atmospheres for the partial pressure of carbon monoxide. So I'd have 0.598 squared. The, um, hang on just a second, that should be written that way. They were inverted. Uh, so I'd have 0.598 squared divided by 0.159, and that will equal 2.25. So that is an example for how you would use the rice table. As I mentioned, I'm going to go through and have a third video that is doing nothing but these types of problems. So you can kind of see how to work them out. Okay, so we're now going to shift our attention to Le Chatelier's principle. Uh, for Le Chatelier's principle, when we have some type of chemical system that's at equilibrium being disturbed, the reaction is always going to move in a way that will reestablish the equilibrium by undergoing a net reaction in one direction or another that will reduce the effect of that stress that is added. When the system is disturbed, you have a change in conditions that forces it temporarily out of the equilibrium. Uh, I'll go through an example with that, dealing with the concept of Q here in just a moment. But the system will respond to reestablish the equilibrium position. Again, a shift to the left means that you have a net reaction from the products to the reactants. A shift to the right means that you have a net reaction from the reactants to the products. Okay, so let's look first at a change in the concentration of one of our substances. So this is again where we can use that Q concept to help us figure it out. So if I'm looking at a simple reaction where I have say A forms B. So when I'm looking at this reaction, if the concentration of A increases, then the system is going to shift in a way that will consume some of the extra a molecules. So if the 
reactant is added, then the equilibrium would shift to the right. And just want you to kind of think about that in terms of K. I have a K value here, and let's just say it's equal to 100. And that is my ratio of B over A. So when I do something to disturb the equilibrium system, now if I have an addition of A, and A is in the denominator, that would make my reaction quotient smaller than 100. So if this here was, let's just say 1000 versus 10, my B quantity stays the same. So I'm gonna keep that as 1000, but let's say that we doubled the amount of A, and so that increases to 20. Well now, instead of my K equaling 100, my K is now only equal to 50 instead. And so as a result, because my Q is less than my value for K, my reaction therefore would shift to the right to produce more product. By doing so, I'm gonna reduce the number for the denominator. I'm gonna increase the number for the numerator until they once again have a ratio equal to 100. If I have the product that is being added, now that's gonna make my Q become larger. So I'd have a larger value than K, so my reaction would shift to the left. So if you just kind of think about it, whichever direction you're adding the substance to in your reaction, it's gonna shift in the opposite direction. If you have a substance being removed from the system, now in that case, again, it's going to cause the reaction to shift towards the direction that that substance was removed because it's going to want to replace what was lost. So if I use the same analogy that I started with, if I have the B over A for that reaction and I remove some of B, let's say that it goes down to 800 over 10 instead. So that would now give me a Q of 80 and now my Q is going to be less than K. And as a result, my reaction is going to shift to produce more products. So it would shift to the right, which if you notice, that is where B is found. If I would remove some of A, now my denominator would be smaller. So I'd need to shift some of the products over to the reactants. You can think about these things in terms of the collision theory, which we talked about with kinetics. By increasing the concentration of A, I'm gonna have more collisions that are taking place between the reactant molecules. And so I'd have a greater proportion of B that would get formed. If I remove A from the reaction, now I would have less collisions occurring between the reactant molecules. And so the B molecules initially would still be colliding at the same rate. And so I'd have a greater shift going towards the left. So you can think about it in either type of fashion, uh, but just remember whenever you're increasing the concentration of a substance involved in the chemical or reaction, it's going to shift in the opposite direction. When you remove a substance from the reaction, then it's gonna to shift to replace what was lost. So it's gonna to shift towards that substance. So again, um, only the substances that are your aqueous or your gaseous substances can affect the value for Q because if it's not a part of that expression, it is not going to be able to impact the value for Q. So if I have a solid and I add more of the solid, doesn't matter, it's still gonna be at equilibrium. So you have that. And then just remember, the only thing that changes the value for K is temperature. So if we look at a little bit more concrete example, uh, if we have some type of addition of a substance for a reaction, you will see as in this first example here, I have an initial concentration of PCL3 of 0.2, I have Cl2 as 0.125, and I have the PCL3 as, that should be a PCL5, as 0.6. So if I were to set up the K for this equilibrium system, I'd have 0.600 divided by 0.200 
and 0.125. So if I were to solve for that, 0.6 and 0.2, that would be 3 divided by 0.125. So that should be equal to approximately 24 for my K. So when we have the equilibrium system have something introduced, in this case, we added more Cl2 into that reaction vessel. That gave me a new concentration of 0.2. Because it is a new initial concentration, it is not at equilibrium, so I need to solve for Q. So if I were to plug those values back in for Q, and I had 0 0.600 divided by 0 0.200 and divided again by 0 0.200, now my Q would be equal to 15. So as I'm going through this here, again, my Q would be less than my value for K. So as a result, I need to increase the amount of product. So I'm adding the plus sign for X onto my rice table. So I'd have the initial 0.6 plus a little bit more as that reaction shifts over. And then on the reactant side, I would have a minus X because we want the denominator to get smaller. So I'd have 0.2 minus X, I have the initial 0.125 plus the 0 0.075. That gives me an initial new concentration of Cl2 of 0.2 as well. So I'd have 0.2 minus X for that concentration. So then I could just simply plug in and solve for X with what the new concentration would be. But again, I will get into that in that third video for one of those types of problems. But hopefully this can show you mathematically Again, how we can determine the reaction shifting, because again, since my Q is less than K, I want the 15 to go back up to 24. So I can readjust the concentrations to make it equal to 24. So the next one that we're going to focus on are changes in pressure. Now, the changes in pressure will affect the volume if we have a gaseous system. So only gases will be affected by changes in pressure. Remember aqueous solutions, because they're liquid, they are not able to be compressed, so you will not have any changes in volume based off of that. So when we look at the equilibrium, the changes in the concentration of the gas or the partial pressures of the gases components will cause the equilibrium to shift one direction or another. Now, when we look at this, the way how the reaction shifts will occur. If we are increasing the pressure, that is going to cause more collisions to take place within that reaction vessel. So in order to lower the pressure inside, the reaction is gonna to shift to the side that contains the fewest number of moles of gaseous substances. So if we increase the pressure, again, shifts towards side with the fewest moles of gaseous particles. And if we have a decrease in pressure, now we have fewer collisions taking place. So the system in order to increase the pressure is going to want to increase the number of collisions. So for this decrease in pressure, the reaction will shift towards the side with the greatest amount instead of the least, the greatest amount of gaseous particles. Now we have a couple other scenarios that can take place, which we didn't really talk a whole lot about last year. If we add an inert gas into the system, they typically will have no effect on the equilibrium position as long as the volume of the container does not change. So if I have a fixed container instead of a flexible container, then adding that inert gas will have no bearing on the reaction because the partial pressures for those gases involved in the reaction will not change. If the volume does change because the inert gas is added, then that would cause the amount of collisions to change 
and therefore the partial pressure of those substances would change as well. So therefore the reaction would shift to reestablish equilibrium in those cases. The other scenario is what would take place if we had equal numbers of moles of gaseous reactants and products. So if I have zero for that change in gaseous reactants and products, i.e. I've got two moles of gaseous reactants and two moles of gaseous products, now there's no advantage by shifting in one direction or the other, so the equilibrium reaction will not be affected. So you can see in this diagram, if we have the middle container being the reaction at equilibrium, if we increase the volume, which would give us a lower pressure, I now have these particles spread further apart. So there's gonna be less frequent collisions with the container walls. And so as a result, I would have a drop in the pressure. So what is gonna take place? Some of those gaseous product molecules, the green, spheres are going to transform into more of the blue and the orange. So if you notice in the middle container, I had three of the blue spheres. I had two of the orange spheres. I now have that reaction shift. So I have four of the uh, blue spheres. And then I have what's that? four of the green spheres as well. Oh, no, I do have three in the first one. Uh, so I'd have an increase in the reactant molecules my number of particles if you count them we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen for the initial container and then for the container on the left i have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen in the container so i now have an increase in the number of particles and so as a result of that more collisions taking place, increasing the pressure to reestablish equilibrium. In the opposite side, on the far right, we've now decreased the volume, which means that I have a higher pressure because there's less space between the particles and the container walls. So I have more collisions, frequency is increased. So again, going from those 15 molecules, we now can see that we took some of the blue and some of the orange, reacted them to form some of the green. So I now have, in this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 particles instead of 15. So I've lowered the number of particles that are present within that reaction chamber. That is going to decrease the number of collisions and therefore the partial pressures of those gases inside of the container until it reestablishes the value for K. Okay, so our last example is dealing with changes in temperature. So temperature is a little bit more complicated. You can kind of treat temperature as if it is a reactant or a product in this type of scenario and kind of treat it like it is a change in concentration. But to determine the effect of a change in the temperature on this equilibrium system, we have to think about the, enthal uh, the enthalpy of the reaction. Is it an exothermic or endothermic reaction? So for the heat, if it is a product, hopefully you remember it is being given off. So it is an exothermic reaction. So our delta H value would be less than zero. So I'd have a negative delta H. If my heat is a reactant, then that means that it is an endothermic reaction. And my delta H would be a positive because the overall energy change is increasing from reactants to products. So if we increase the temperature that is adding heat and adding the heat will cause the reaction to always move in the endothermic direction. A decrease in the temperature would remove heat from the system which would mean that it is a exothermic reaction uh, that would be favored in that instance. So again, you can kind of look at it in those two types of scenarios, um, whether you want to treat it like it's a concentration or just simply memorize. 
increase in the temperature causes the reaction to move in the endothermic direction. Decrease in the temperature because it wants to replace the heat that was lost is going to make the reaction move in the exothermic direction. Just remember for any of these reactions that we would have, let's just say that we had A plus 2B forms 3C. So just remember as we're going through this type of process, because it is an equilibrium system, I have a forward direction and I have a reverse direction. So if I said that my delta H for this was equal to negative 100 kilojoules per mole, then I know that heat would be a product. So in the forward direction, I could say A plus 2B forms 3C, and then I could say plus heat. But in the reverse direction, I would have 3C plus the heat forms A plus 2B. So notice here on the forward direction, I have heat as a product. So therefore, this one would be exothermic. And then in the reverse direction, now I have heat acting as a reactant. So that would make this reaction endothermic as a result. So any reaction will always have an endo and an exothermic direction. So if I add heat to the system, again, treating it like the Q concept, I'd be increasing my numerator. So it's going to shift towards the left to increase the amount in the denominator. If I look at heat being removed from the system, now in that type of situation, again, it's gonna go in the exothermic direction, so we need to have it as a product. So it would therefore lower the amount for Q in the numerator. So I'm gonna shift it to the right to produce more of the product. With the change in temperature, that is the only one that will change the value for K. So let's look at how temperature affects the value for K. Since temperature is the only factor that will affect the value for K for any given equilibrium system, again, if we think about those concepts that we just learned about, if my delta H value is greater than zero, so again, I have that endothermic reaction, then I'm going to see an increase in the temperature causing K to increase as well. So hopefully that makes sense because the heat is located on the reactant side. The addition of heat would cause the K to increase because it is going to try to consume the heat and form more product. So increase in the temperature on an endothermic reaction causes the value for K to increase. If we have the temperature being decreased, then obviously an endothermic reaction would have the value for K decrease as well. If I have an exothermic reaction, one where delta H is a negative value, now it's the exact opposite. Since heat is now located on the product side, an increase in the heat is going to cause the system to shift towards the left, which would lower the product concentration and increase the reactant concentration. And so that would make the value for K become smaller. So K will decrease when you increase on an exothermic reaction. If you remove heat and you cause it to shift in the direction of the exothermic reaction, then K would increase. So the last thing we're gonna look at is the addition of a catalyst for Le Chatelier's principle to an equilibrium system. So when we add a catalyst, it will not change the value for K, unlike the lowercase k for the rate constant in kinetics, if you add a catalyst that will increase the value for the little k for that rate constant, but for equilibrium systems, it will not change the value for K. This will not shift the position that is found on the equilibrium position. It will just simply make the reaction reach equilibrium at a faster pace. So you can see here in the diagram from the potential energies, the heat content of the reactants and products is gonna stay the same. 
The only thing that we're changing is the amount of energy required to overcome the activation energy. When we look at the catalysts, it's going to lower both the activation energy for the forward and for the reverse reactions equally. And so we will still establish the same equilibrium, but just at a faster pace. So what we have here is just a chart that is summarizing all of the different effects on the equilibrium position and on the value for K. So any type of concentration change, again, there's no effect on K. If we increase the reactants, it's gonna shift to form more product. If we decrease the reactants, shifting to form more of the reactants. Increasing product shifts to form more reactant. Decreasing the product shifts to form more of the product. If we increase the pressure on the system, it's going to shift towards the formation of fewer moles of gas. If it is going to decrease the pressure, then it is going to shift towards the side with more moles of gas. And then finally, adding an inert gas or having no change in volume with that, you would not have any change in the position. For temperature, if we increase the temperature, it's going to move towards the absorption of heat, which again is the endothermic direction. And that will cause the value for um, K to increase if it is an endothermic reaction. It will decrease if it is exothermic reactions. If we decrease the temperature, it's always going to move in the exothermic direction. So in that situation, if we decrease the temperature, it's going to go towards a side that will release the heat because it wants to produce more of it. So if it increases the, uh, it'll increase the value for K in an exothermic reaction, it'll decrease the value for K in an endothermic reaction. And finally, for your catalyst, again, forward and reverse rates are changed equally. So the overall reaction has no shift. It just attains the equilibrium at a faster pace. Okay, so let's look at another example problem. We're going to determine the direction of shift as equilibrium is approached. So this says at 448 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium constant Kc for this reaction, H2 plus I2 forms 2Hi, is 50.5. So I'm just going to write that down here. My Kc equals 50.5. Predict in which direction the reaction proceeds to reach equilibrium if we start with 2.0 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of Hi, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of H2, and 3.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of I2 in a 2 liter container. Now, here's the key thing, two liter container. We're given information about the number of moles. Since we're dealing with Kc, I know that needs to be molarities. So I'm gonna start off by figuring out my initial concentrations of each of my substances. So for the Hi, I have 2.0 times 10 to the minus two moles. Divide that by 2.0 liters, so I'd have 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. I have 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles divided by 2 liters, and that would give me 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3rd molar for the H2. And finally, 3.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles divided by 2 liters equals 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2 molar I2. So at this point, those are my initial concentrations. So I'm going to put the little not symbol there for that. So to solve for Q, I would have the concentration of HI squared divided by the concentration of H2 and I2. So if I plug my values in, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 2 concentration squared divided by 5.0 times 10 to the minus third and 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2. And I plug that in, I get 1.33 
for my value of Q. So in this case, my Q would be less than my value for K. So I need to increase the amount of product that would form. So my reaction will shift to the right. Okay, so we're going to finish off this lesson with a quick example for Le Chatelier's principle. So we have the following equilibrium system, N2O4, breaks down into 2NO2 with a delta H of a positive 58 kilojoules. So I know this part right here tells me that this is an endothermic reaction. So I know I can add heat to the reactant side. So now in which direction will the equilibrium shift when N2O4 is added? So again, if we add it to the N2O4, that means I'm going to have more reactant molecules colliding. So it's going to give me a net effect of producing more product. So for A, the reaction would shift to the right. If I remove NO2, same type of thing. I have the same number of collisions occurring between the N2O4 molecules, but by removing the NO2, I would have fewer product molecules colliding. So the rate of the reverse reaction would decrease. So I would need to increase the number of product molecules to increase the rate of the reverse reaction. So this will shift to the right once again. The pressure is increased. So if I add N2 into this system, it is not part of the equilibrium expression. So we're going to assume in this case that the overall reaction volume is not changing. So in this case, we would say neither. And for D, it tells us the volume is increased. So if I increase the volume of the system, that would mean that I would be lowering the pressure. So the system is going to move in the direction that will go to the greater number of moles. So that would be going to the right. And then finally, if we decrease the temperature, so if I lower the amount of temperature, the reaction is going to shift to replace the heat, which would mean this being an endothermic reaction, the system would shift towards the left. And in that case, because it shifts to the left, the K value would decrease. All right, so like I said, we are going to do one more video um, lecture on this unit where I will go in and work through a bunch of um, rice table problems for you just to kind of show you how to work out some of those problems. Um, please come to class with any questions that you may have and we will um, continue to work through our equilibrium. Have a great evening.